In the beginning, there was James Rolfe. What a shitload of fuck. Piece of shit. Son of a bitch. Ah! Puke up a donkey's ass. Kicks your ass till diarrhea comes out your dick. I'd rather suck farts out of a dog's ass. Fuck off. Shit. It's diarrhea. Horrible. The man who single-handedly changed how internet review content would be made on not just YouTube but social media as a whole, James Rolfe and his character of the angry video game nerd has reached success very few on the internet have ever achieved. Cementing himself as a granddaddy e-celebrity who still produces content to this day, many people across the globe were inspired to do, if not exactly the same content, content reminiscent of the format Rolf employed. Personality-based, often comedic critiques with colorful superlatives and fictional characters crossing over for the occasional beatdown or defense of their own intellectual property from the vile critic who's making the video. And among the sea of ABGN clones and offshoots that have their own notable fan bases, one stood out in particular as both a rallying point for various smaller creators, as well as a fallible, often incompetent artist who simply wants to be taken seriously. I'm in a weird mood. Let's talk about white chicks. Doug Walker, also known by his character of the Nostalgia Critic, is a figure who will forever live in internet infamy. Not just for the joint production company Channel Awesome that he runs with his brother Rob and associate Mike Michaud, not just for creating a hub for creators and critics just like them on the website That Guy With The Glasses, and not just for fighting hard against fair use copyright law in the early 2010s, no. He'll live in infamy for the aggressive declining quality of his current work and mistreatment of various critics and employees who had previously associated with them. And while I have a personal soft spot for Doug's early work and his love of snark has definitely rubbed off on me, there's one other Channel Awesome creator who split off from the company during the hashtag change the channel movement in 2018 who I hold a much fonder appreciation for. Even if parts of the internet don't necessarily like him back. Look, there he is! There he is! Get him! Get him out of here! Get him the hell out of here! That cuts to the artist beating shit out of him. <laughs> fucking ripping his jacket up. Lewis Lovehog is primarily a comic book and sometimes obscure pop media critic who started making videos in 2008 in his parents' house in his early 20s and has since made over 700 videos over the course of 15 years. While still subject to the same issues, occasional public controversy for past actions, and of course, the worst part of all, still being on Twitter. You boss, fuck you, man. I hold Linkara's content in an equal and sometimes much higher regard than Doug Walker's, because while Doug's content can be entertaining and occasionally <clears throat> thought-provoking, I feel like Linkara's content influenced my general taste in comic books and by extension media critique the most out of these channel awesome creators. The other ones will still show up in this video, albeit in much different context than their usual reviews. For you see, what if I told you that within Linkara's own comic book review show, a tale was being told. A yarn that's lasted over a decade, spanning the known multiverse and the darkest recesses of the human mind. One with rich characters and high concept battles, filled to the brim with lore and pseudoscience. What if what I'm doing right now isn't just a bit to introduce the storylines of the top the fourth wall? That the sometimes cringy and poorly shot scenes Linkara has strung together during his many reviews are actually compelling? Let's set some ground rules before diving headfirst into Linkara lore, for lack of a better shorthand term. This video will be exclusively covering all publicly available storylines on the Atop the Fourth Wall YouTube channel, while occasionally referencing outside material such as the That Guy with the Glasses anniversary films to provide context on current events in the story. While various creators will appear and disappear throughout the narrative weaved, I'm going to try my hardest to avoid talking about their personal lives because I'm only privy to stuff publicly available, and I don't want to stir up drama I have no business being a part of. While I do have my critiques of Doug Walker and various internet reviewers that have come and gone, the most that they'll get along with Lewis is some light ribbing here and there. Lastly, and this is the most important part, this is not a video mocking Linkara's internet history or critiquing his character on a personal level. Rather, it's an analysis of the ambitious and sometimes tumultuous stories he tried to tell while making a comic book review show on the internet. The actual critiques of the content at hand are mostly craft issues, the more harsh ones being situational and need build up to properly say, and again, I am aware that Linkara has tried and failed to make his own independent projects, and recently actually succeeded with Winter of 83. They will only be mentioned if necessary, which is very rare. Now, with that all out of the way, let's put on our trilbies, purchase our mysterious magic guns from the local flea market, and journey into the world of Atop the Fourth Wall where bad comics burn. Hello, I'm Linkara, and I approve the compilation of this video. Part 1. Phantom Blood. Uh, Sorry, his heart is steel.
Before we get to the nitty gritty of overarching lore, let's lay down the basic facts. In the beginning, Linkara was simply reviewing comics from the couch in his parents' house. And while in canon, it is acknowledged that it is his family's home, every location Linkara tends to live in gets possessed by malevolent forces every Halloween, and is often broke into by fictional characters such as X-Men's Cable, the Pyramid Head of Silent Hill, and of course his own personal adversaries, which we'll get to later. Alongside those threats to Linkara's safety are the various bit-joke characters that will inevitably snowball into fully fleshed out people and allies to Linkara's cause. All of them are, of course, played by Linkara. In fact, half the cast usually is. But the core cast members are usually Linkara duplicates, and while the similarities between each person are acknowledged in canon, unless it's outright stated it's a Linkara duplicate, you're just gonna have to accept these characters as different people. These include Harvey Finevoice, an Italian-American lounge singer who often calls Linkara the kid and acts as occasional muscle. 90s Kid, a loud 90s pop culture obsessed weirdo who interjects during some of Lewis's reviews for the sake of stressing how great the 90s were. There's the Ninja Style Dancer, who originally existed as a one-off gag from his Nightcat No. 1 review before becoming a fully-fledged member of the team with occasional memorable moments. Uh, occasional. And of course, there's Linkara's personal robot he builds in front of the viewers during this storyline, Poyo. A sentient AI in a small blue body, Poyo exists merely as a sidekick and technical support at first, in canon acting as an employee of Lewis's for his web show. He's behind the camera. There's also Lewis's parents, Lauren and Avanel, oh, I'm sorry if I mispronounced that, who are both incredibly supportive of their son's creative ventures, and I cannot stress how much I love that. So much so that Lauren Lovehog himself not just plays a future version of Linkara in this and various other storylines, but also a future antagonist we've yet to meet. I digress, but our first bit of definitive lore comes in the form of a mysterious magic coin. There's a... there's a Lugia on it? Uh, don't question it. One that Linkara obtains secondhand and uses at the end of his Charles Barkley vs. Godzilla review to grow over 50 feet tall. Despite the harm done to the people of Minnesota, this coin will not be out of harmful hands for the rest of its existence. The next major story beat is when Linkara, after being warped into Silent Hill on Halloween, catching the aforementioned Pyramid Head in a Pokeball for future use. Yes, a Pokeball. You may be thinking, huh, this is a very weird and needless gag. It only gets weirder. The first major villain we're introduced to is the then-current President of the United States, Dr. Insano, who wishes to eventually conquer the whole world using the power of science for his own sick wishes. Of course! Don't you know anything about science? He pilots the robot known as Neutro, another reference to a review Linkara was doing at the time. Linkara foils the good doctor's plans by bodying the giant Neutro with a now signature I AM A MAN punch. And for a time, Insano goes silent. Then, during a crossover review with the video game reviewer and former friend of the channel Noah the Spoony One Antweiler, Dr. Insano causes an incursion of multiple universes. A crisis-level event, if you will, where multiple versions of Linkara and Spoonie are forced to review a copy of Warrior No. 1 before his plans are ultimately foiled by... him. The true villain of this arc, a red-eyed doppelganger of Linkara with a skeletal robotic arm. This will later be known to us as Mechakara, who crossed over during the incursion to kill the Linkara of this universe due to events in his own. Mechakara acts in the background, trying to sabotage Linkara's reviews through minor inconveniences, killing his crossover gag characters, bringing to life Lewis's least favorite maxi series, Countdown to Infinite Crisis, which is the second living comic in the show's run, and even pretending to be Linkara during one review to have his fans turn on him. And during all of this, Spoonie is killed by Insano's hired assassin, Squall, from Final Fantasy VIII. Spoonie, already having a tendency to self-destruct anyways, has his apartment self-destruct, leaving only a clump of himself behind. And while Linkara mourns his friend's loss, he's compelled to play God. And so, through the help of <laughs> Linkara manages to clone Spoonie one-to-one, -one, while also plugging his incomplete comic, Revelation of the Mask. Let's not ignore the moral implications of this action. Not only will it become important later that this clone exists at all, but the very fact Linkara was willing to insert his own biases into the clone shows that Linkara is not a great person. He toes the line between genuine hero and selfish asshole constantly, and while in some arcs it's more clear-cut what side he stands on, in others it will question who Linkara is at his core. After yet another fight with Dr. Insano, Linkara manages to return the real Spoonie to life after coercing a then-planted Black Lantern ring off of him. However, immediately after this crossover, Mechakar kills Spoonie again. 
making him, until Linkara pisses him off at the end of the arc, his own personal Black Lantern servant. Mechakara then springs into action, kidnapping Lewis after he finishes a review and explaining who he truly is. He's Poyo. What? Not our Poyo, but a Poyo from a dimension that faced a robot uprising and inevitably a war against tech and magic. He killed the Linkara of his universe due to how annoyed he was at Linkara's general life choices, but it brought him no catharsis. So he decided to go Eobard Thawne on this Linkara and try to make every moment he could torturous for him until he went in for the kill. Linkara's friends come to back him up in the fight against Mechakara, but one by one, the gang goes down. Our universe's Poyo arrives, incredibly confused, as both Linkara and Mechakara try to convince them of their respective point of views. Mechakara offers him freedom, while Linkara offers him a promotion. Understanding that in the post-2008 economic climate, it's very hard to get a job that not only rooms and boards you, but also provides full health benefits, Poyo makes his choice pretty quickly. Linkara henshins for the first time into his internet reviewer outfit and seemingly vaporizes Mechakara. The day saved and Poyo getting to shit-talk comic book legend Garth Ennis on atop the fourth wall. Meanwhile, Dr. Insano has actually preserved the living Mechakara, torturing him personally due to the grave injustice of making Insano cut his hair. Huh? And that's the first storyline! It sets up everything nice and neat and provides a great antagonist for future stories, however, the next storyline won't have Mechakara as an antagonist. Instead, another refugee from an alternate universe will rear his goggled head. If there's one thing I can say about this storyline is that it's ambitious, especially for somebody who wasn't clearly planning on doing this at first. Whether it was a way to sell him as a writer to future readers of his comics, or just to funnel his creativity into the thing that he loved doing the most, the little twists and turns about Mechakara and everything that's been happening in the background of the story actually work. It feels like a comic book in the best and worst ways. And we're only getting started. <laughs> Part 2. The Other Insano in the previous storyline, there was one thing that went wrong that wasn't Mechakara's fault, the continuity alarm breaking. While the continuity alarm existed as a gag to poke holes in faulty writing, it was used to stress an oncoming antagonist quite effectively. But if it wasn't Mechakara who broke the alarm, who did? Why, it's Dr. Link Sano, a seemingly more incompetent version of the good doctor who, alongside his unseen brother, became revolutionary scientists on their Earth before Link Sano purposely left their universe during the crisis event. Why he left his universe is up in the air for now, as this is a more comedic short storyline. While living in Linkara's family storage room and tormenting him with a copy of sultry teenage super foxes, Link Sano works on a dubious plan to summon Insanos from across the multiverse to build an army strong enough to conquer anywhere he pleases. After some infighting and cameos from that guy with the glasses creators, Linkara and his pals fight against Dr. Linksano and subsequently kick their asses. After all is said and done, Insano returns home from the convention the crew filmed at at that particular weekend, and unbeknownst to him, the eye of Mechakara starts to glow. This isn't the only mention of Mechakara in this arc, as he appears in a dream sequence teasing the true threat coming in the next one. This storyline, while introducing future allies and teasing future threats, is honestly really short. The biggest thing worth noting about this arc is the introduction of Iron Liz, who will be featured in future story arcs as an ally slash roommate to Linkara until around Storyline 6. From there, she only makes one more appearance, and that's it. Which is both a shame, but understandable given they were dating at some point, and regardless of my own personal feelings towards Liz, SHE'S A COMIC SKATER! WHAT THE fuck? Let's be honest. Would you want to work with your ex? No. So that's all I'll say. Another highlight of this particular arc are the cameos near the end of past Channel Awesome creators, including Doug Walker himself. Moments like these in hotel rooms during cons where you're meeting your internet friend for probably the first time and doing shit together really sells this feeling of community that guy with the glasses had back in the day. I know that's kind of parasocial and eventually things devolved over time, but this was a simpler time. Before the Patreons, before the Let's Player parodies, before Doug tried to kill the critic and make demo reel. It was just a bunch of people making content they enjoy to escape the doldrum of their everyday lives. That's not to say the stories they made for themselves were without conflict. Now that Linkara's left his old place, I'm taking over! Self-destruct sequence activated. Self-destruct. Uh, 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 Part 3. All that he sees, he conquers. Linksano interrupts a review to tell Linkara that the man he fears is coming to this dimension, and that he's taking his leave. 
As Linksano attempts to teleport away, he and Linkara are warped to an unknown location. Linkara goes missing for a month. Harvey, 90s kid, and Liz taking over the show as Poyo locates his energy signature. And once Poyo finally discovers Linkara's location and plans on beaming him back, he accidentally brings along a squad of cloaked phantoms Linkara calls Shades. These magic-powered robots were scanning Linkara in their master spaceship. And while Linkara and friends defeat them easily, the pointsman made clear. This Lord Vice, as he's called, is a dangerous individual. A conqueror whose goals are to chase down and to defeat some mysterious entity. Linkara starts to prepare for war. Expanding his arsenal of freedom as Vice's presence builds more and more in the background. Linkara finds an ally in the form of Lieutenant Alexander Monroe, a Star Trek Elite Force character who I have zero knowledge of outside of this lore, but whatever, we have contacts with Starfleet now. Hooray. Meanwhile, Lord Vice has somehow managed to revive Mechakara, enlisting the help of a desperate Dr. Linksano to rebuild him. While Lord Vice is ready to go and kill Linkara personally, Mechakara once again opts for a psychological attack. This time, though, he'll have the help of a little... magic. After Linkara and Iron Liz move to their new apartment to temporarily escape Vice's watchful eye, which doesn't really make any sense right now, but... There's a simple explanation for that. Linkara once again becomes stuck in Silent Hill. This time, though, he's being tortured with the visages of all of his friends and enemies, telling him he's a murderer. All the while, the fog gets closer and closer, until he's truly trapped in the nightmare created by Lord Vice and... Well... Let me tell you a tale. A long time ago, there lived a little girl who lived with her mother and father. She loved her parents very much, and while they loved her back, they loved their dark god even more. In order to fulfill their sadistic god's goal of total control over the known universe, the parents and their religious sect decided to create a weapon to further purge non-believers from this world. This weapon would be powerful, but it came at a cost. The young girl's soul. All of her rage, all of her anger at the betrayal of her family, funneled into the weapon. A buckshot pistol, one that, once finished, slaughtered the entire cult where they stood. And while that anger lay dormant even after Linkara came into possession of the gun, Vice somehow awoke it, making the girl in the gun believe that those who turned her into this thing were still alive. And so, the girl's rage, separate from the girl herself, wants to break Linkara. But the funny thing about Linkara is that he won't be broken. He's faced far, far worse than self-doubt and petty mind control. He's done more than any average man, and he won't be beaten by a half-cocked phantom. With the shot of his gun and a cringe, I mean heroic speech, Linkara is freed from Vice's grip. Mechakara wants to keep trying to break Linkara's mind, but Vice orders the ship to prepare for a full-on offensive. After video game reviewer and resident spaceship owner Angry Joe Vargas locates Vice ship in Earth's orbit, Linkara and crew prepare for the inevitable. First comes a lone assault from Mechakara, who once again gets a huge upper hand against Linkara and Iron Liz with the help of Liz's own doppelganger, Judas Liz! Get it? Because Iron Liz is a reference to Iron Maiden and Judas Priest is a metal. Fucking forget it! All seems lost until Linkara pulls out the weapons he's been preparing since he's returned from Vice's ship. A new Zeo Gold Power Staff, and, of course, a brand new form. Lightbringer Linkara! <laughs> Sorry, Gold Ranger Linkara. This inevitably leads to Linkara and Mechakara fighting in the streets of Minnesota, Mechakara using the magic coin to grow giant while Linkara pilots a newly acquired Neutro. Annihilating most of Mechakara's body, all that remains is his arm. And it's still moving. Vice is pissed and comes down to deal with Linkara personally, but during their struggle, Linkara fires a blast into a specific part of Vice's armor. Vice retreats at the last second, leaving Linkara bloody and broken. Linkara ponders why Vice didn't finish the job, and then he finally gets it. Using his personal agent on Vice's ship for information and Mechakara's remaining limb to gain contact with Vice, Linkara goads Vice into coming back for a rematch. And who is this agent in Vice's circle? Who do you think? As Angry Joe and his Joe army take down Vice's army of shades, Linkara and the gang exposit how exactly Linkara beat him. TLDR, multiverse sickness. In Linkara's own lore, passing into a different dimension isn't the same as going to a new location. A universe's very laws of physics can reject a dimensional traveler outright if they aren't wearing protective armor or harboring an anchor to their home dimension. 
And since Vice's body is less physically stable in this universe without his special power armor, he's fucked. But not dead. Forced to make do with marooning him on an isolated wintertime dimension, Linkara vows to right the wrongs Vice committed in the known multiverse, granting him a mercy by keeping him alive. This will come back to bite him. But for now, the gang will go about systematically freeing the remnants of Vice's empire across the known multiverse. Linkara even taking Vice's ship as his own, christening it Comicron 1, which he was supposed to name the Vigilant, but chickened out of his own pole and named the stealth ship the Vigilant instead. And so, the storyline comes to a close, with things returning to a sense of normalcy as Linksano's uneasy alliance with Linkara seems relatively intact. This arc is massive, showing the lengths Lewis is willing to go in plotting his storylines and implementing them, as well as special effects, into his reviews. And while some of it comes off as overly expository and fairly predictable, the ambition on display is certainly something to say the least. Though there's one thing that Lord Vice, as well as the absent grimoire Linkara received in Silent Hill detailing the occult, mentioned that draws the most intrigue. This dark god the little girl in the gun was made for, the being that Vice chased to this dimension, the piece of the world that is missing. The Entity. Just... what are they? It's missing now. It's fucking... <sighs> it's fucking missing now! Part 4. Diamond is not crashed. So Missing No is a notorious glitch in the original Pokemon Red and Blue that, when encountered, would either corrupt your game save potentially or add infinite resources into your inventory 6 slot. The thing about Missing No, other than the collective Pokemon fandom accepting them as almost canon, is that it could take on several appearances. One of which is a fossil, which somehow scared a 10-year-old Linkara when he tried catching it. In fact, this traumatized him so much, he essentially made a feature-length creepypasta to integrate into his comic book review show, as a way to cope with the greater trauma inflicted. I, I wish I could say I'm exaggerating, but I'm really not. So, why is Missing No an eldritch god that rivals the greater pantheons of H.P. Lovecraft and Robert E. Howard? In an alternate universe, the corruption within the game soon became a reality distortion, a sentient being of pure data which grew capable of consuming whole planets within hours. This corruption would grow so powerful as to naturally gain the ability to cross dimensions, which it most certainly did after taking out Vice's home dimension. Vice would hunt down Missing No across multiple dimensions, damaging it over the course of his many hunts, but self-admittedly fails to recognize when Missing No is using a host or not. This is where 90s Kid comes in, who is possessed by Missing No, since the entity itself cannot exist without a host in different dimensions, as they slowly start erasing people from existence. He starts with a small part of Minnesota, tying back into what both the absent Grimoire said as well as an injured ninja-style dancer in the most important moment he's ever had to date. A piece of the world is missing. Its voice is not its own. Throughout multiple reviews, Linkara's recurring cast of characters and friends in the reviewer-verse are all ripped from existence, including Linkara's new clown character Bufo, who I'm... I'm sorry, it's just not relevant at all, so this is just gonna be the last time I'm mentioning him. Say goodbye to Bufo! Bye! Bye! Bye, Bufo! I don't fucking miss you! Bye! Get the fuck out! Linkara, of course, discovers the truth when all but him and 90s Kid are the last people left on Earth. And while Linkara is eventually cornered into doing a review of the floppy version of Pokemon the Electric Tail of Pikachu, he regains his resolve and manages to talk Missing No into... well... killing himself. You should kill yourself! Now! <laughs> And in a great explosion of data consciousness, reality heals, people return, and the entity that Vice has been hunting this whole time has finally been vaporized. Woohoo! Except for one teensy tiny piece that the entity left behind as a gift. Though, Linkara doesn't know that right now. In the midst of his tale of killing an eldritch god with the power of Takno Jutsu, Linkara has built a new AI system for Comicron 1 named Nimue. However, during Nimue's integration into Comicron 1, an Ion Storm temporarily traps Liz in a mirror universe, one where Dr. Insano is actually a good guy, and Linkara's taste in comics are pretty much exactly the same. This goes about as well as you'd think. The same goes for his Halloween confrontation with Father Watley, a pastor for the cult that killed the girl that lives in Linkara's gun. And while they're nice character moments that push forward character arcs and introduce more players in Lewis's D&D campaign, 
I think now is the time to bring up how Lewis has filmed these segments, or rather, Lewis's aptitude for film. In short, he's a student of film, but not a film student if that makes any sense. He's seen a lot of movies, he has the basic idea of filmmaking, and by now has experimented with the form, so good on him. But hasn't stepped foot on a set that wasn't somehow review-related, or anniversary movie-related, or his own storyline movie, period. And it shows. Lewis spends a lot of time just monologuing in place, either about himself or explaining why things are happening the way they are happening, and it just goes on and on and on, and it's shot, reverse, shot, 90s kid nodding, Harvey nodding, there's nothing more interesting we could be seeing, and a way less winded way of saying all this information. The early storylines had charm in the way early AVGN moments had charm, but despite Linkara literally just facing a robot clone of himself and morphing into a Power Ranger now three times with this storyline, Lewis was undeniably taking the storylines more seriously. That ambition was and still is the draw to the strange little world Lewis has made, and now that the production value has seemingly gone up, we can critique it more fairly. While well, all that he sees he conquers was an arc that did plenty to build on lore and characters of the series, a piece of the world is missing marks a transition toward higher stakes and greater questions to ponder for our main characters. This is where things get more interesting, but I can't ignore the craft issues that pervade the storylines any further, and it won't be going away anytime soon. I will say though, they get better at compositing in green screen, so that's neat. Part 5. His Blue Soul Skibbity boop bop Skibbity bae So remember when Mechakara died the second time and Linkara put his hand on his shelf and that hand moved? So what if, after making Poyo a new body, Mechakara transferred what little consciousness they had left into said body and started taking revenge once again? Kind of anticlimactic that we're doing this again, but I feel like it could have been a great endpoint for Mechakara's arc. And in execution, it somewhat is. The possessed Poyo model turns on the shades and takes over Comicron 1, separating everybody into different chambers as the ship begins to self-destruct. In a moment of desperation, Linkara asks Poyo if he resents him in any way. If he's truly like Vice, or like Mechakara thinks he is. Because truth be told, he's afraid he'll turn on him. Poyo says that not only Linkara is the best employer he could ask for, he's also his best friend, and Poyo would never betray him. Heartwarming, right? Then he dies. FAIL! Over irradiated in homage to Spock's death in Wrath of Khan, Poyo is seemingly lost forever. And given the existence of Nimue, this might have been a good point to retire the character. Think about it for a second. This would have been the perfect opportunity to finally get rid of Mechakara by giving Poyo a distinct character arc all his own, exploring his feelings not just in relation to Linkara, but in relation to humanity and whether his life can truly be called a life. Mechakara stands in antithesis to everything Poyo is, who offered him a chance at breaking free from the monotony of being part of Lewis's crew. And now that he has access to a new robotic form and the most powerful spaceship in the universe, he can finally achieve his dreams of annihilating humanity. If Poyo, our Poyo, indeed hated humanity as much as Mechakara, as corrupt and messy as they are, did he truly want them dead? Or did he love humanity in spite of those things, believed in working alongside them instead of replacing them? Poyo's sacrifice works fine for the moment as it fulfills the pop culture references Lewis loves shoving into everything, but I simply ask, what if, in regards to these characters? Lewis could have focused on a personal, somewhat small-scale story, given it's confined to Comic-Con 1 mainly, as well as a sci-fi story in line with the shows he references so much. Not so much aping them, but doing something inspired by them. I'm not here to tell Lewis, DO BETTER SLAVE! I know he's capable of creating good original content outside of atop the fourth wall. I just find overly referential media to be twee and unnecessary. However, this isn't how the arc goes. What if I told you that Mechakara wasn't Mechakara at all, and that inside Poyo's body was someone far more intimidating? After spending hundreds of years alone in an alternate dimension due to Linkara's inept attempt at being merciful, Lord Vice decides to transcend flesh and become pure data, just like the monster he's hunted for eons. Beaming himself into Mechakara's arm and taking possession of the new Poyo unit, Vice had been biding his time in the hopes of retaking Comicron 1 to continue hunting Missing No. And while the first time his attempts were foiled, his new body wasn't damaged beyond repair. And once reactivated, Vice tries once again, but... I don't know, it's a little harder now without Poyo, but turns out Poyo's fine! He just transferred himself into the Tom Servo robot that's in Lewis's living room at the last second. Neat. 
With the help of his friends and the newly returned Poyo, the gang take down the delusional Vice who had choice words for Linkara before they attempted to purge him from their systems. First of all, the entity is probably not dead. It either humored Linkara's words and went away temporarily, or Linkara's lying to Vice about them facing Missing No at all. Second of all, there are more than just Missing No out there in the greater multiverse. Eldritch gods that hunger all the same, some much older and more terrifying than the entity. So we end the arc with Linkara pushing the Vice Poyo out into deep space, and the gang, now including Linksano since Linkara talk no jutsu his way into recruiting him as his chief scientist, back home. And I'm sure Vice will never bother our heroes again. Oh my God. His blue soul, although bait and switching one recurring bad for another, executes its core ideas so well I can't really be mad at it. Even if I have a hyper-stylized, how I would write atop the fourth wall headcanon I'd prefer to see, I can't knock the effort and impact some of these moments had. I had feelings at Poyo's death, hope for his revival, thrilled at the reveal of Lord Vice in Poyo's body. These feelings were not something I anticipated feeling going into this, and to be honest, it only becomes more enthralling from here. Linkara understands now that, despite having multiverses at stake, what people are here for are his characters, how they'll grow, change, and bounce off one another in stressful situations, especially his own lead, whose moral compass has been called into question far too many times now, and deserves to be challenged. And this next arc provides all those wild, juicy character bits in spades. Character rock. They think he's just about the money. He doesn't care about actually helping people. He's just like, oh, I just want the fame and fortune. And, you know what I just realized? You probably don't even know who the heck I'm talking about. Who are you anyway? My name is Dan Jurgens, the creator of Booster Gold. <laughs> the problem with Blue Beetle these days. Part 6 Guns and Sorcery. In an alternate dimension, fair use and copyright law has become so restricted that any form of media critique may subject a person to serious jail time. One of these critics, a music reviewer named Jarris and his wife Johanna, were sent to a maximum security prison before being freed by a freedom-fighting critics group. Like Linkara and every other internet reviewer with an in-canon lore, he had access to not only advanced tech in the form of his custom AI Sierra, which is another Linkara, of course, as well as his own magic gun, one of a pair that Johanna had herself. In the efforts of freeing their country from the waste of tax dollars persecuting internet reviewers creates, Jairus traveled through multiple dimensions, recruiting magic gun users like himself. While hopeful he would make a difference, everyone but his wife and himself survived their first assault. This made Jairus reconsider his approach, instead choosing to steal magic guns once they've reached their full potential from gun users in multiple dimensions to make a stockpile. Full potential is basically full synchro from Mega Man Battle Network or Soul Resonance from Soul Eater, You've gained a greater bond with the magic within the gun, it sometimes just takes some intense trauma to produce. And on Jairus' journey, he bursts into Linkara's apartment to steal his gun. This goes poorly, as Linkara gloats how he doesn't care who Jairus is or what they want, they're tired of people breaking into his apartment and underestimating him. Jairus retreats, barely escaping with his life. However, due to time dilation between his house ship and Linkara's universe, five months go by in Linkara's time before he actually arrives on his ship. Jairus has a plan to activate the gun's full potential. Using a phantom he picked up in a different dimension, he can enrage Linkara enough for his gun to fully awaken. However, there might be a small problem. Scan this! Dust plastic and paint. But isn't this your ionizer? Oh no! Oh no! Oh no! Oh no! So the spirit within the gun, after the events of the previous few arcs where Linkara's arrogance and ego started showing more and more, becomes afraid that Linkara may become evil if he continues down his current path. So in an effort to teach him a lesson as well as activate full synchro, shuts down all magic Linkara has cast until he goes on a little journey of self-discovery. This, again, is all in an effort to prevent him from turning evil, as well as to ensure her trust within Linkara before willingly synchronizing with him. So, she endangers literally everyone in the group due to the enchantments on Linkara's home preventing in-home damage and protection from enemy sites being disabled, as well as turning off all the enchantments that have allowed Linkara to use his toy collection as actual tools of war, just so she can make sure Linkara isn't evil. Great plan, Margaret! That's the girl in the gun's name, by the way. It's, uh, it's Margaret. 
need more Margaret. At first, Linkara believes it's the fault of Dr. Insano, who was recently impeached despite helping further space travel for the known world. And after revealing the fact that Linkara has totally no magic to protect him, Insano begins to hatch a plan for total world domination using his love of science and his unyielding resolve. Deciding he'll need the use of a real mage, Linkara first seeks out... Okay, this needs some explaining. So in the anniversary movie, Suburban Nights, there's this evil wizard named Malachite who Doug and the rest of the gang from That Guy with the Glasses fight in the hopes of getting an ancient artifact, and his minions were called Cloaks. The League Cloak, led by Cloak Number 1, is now unemployed due to Malachite's defeat and lives with his slash is played by a Small Potatoes reviewer, One Angry Geek. Basically, he just tells him to seek out this wizard named Steve, who will tell him pretty much everything I just told you about Margaret and her plan, so Linkara sets out on a road trip alone to try and find Steve. This is basically Linkara's excuse to go to cons while using pre-recorded reviews in between lore segments, but this is where we also get into... overarching storyline plans. So you know how Lord Vice was thrown into deep space in Poyo's second body? You know how he was able to just beam his data form into Mechakar's hand before taking over that body in the first place? What if, in the midst of all the chaos that took place during his blue soul, Vice managed to find a way back into Comicron 1 without the notice of Nimue? Nimue, from this point on, is fighting for dominance over her own virtual mind, glitching more and more and corrupting what's left of Linkara's personal equipment. This includes Holokara, a hologram I didn't mention during the events of previous storylines because it wasn't important until now. Basically, it acts as an obedient shadow clone of Linkara that he uses for trickery as well as reviewing in his place. However, due to Vice's influence, Holokara basically becomes a narrative device to both A. Create tension within Linkara's household before Linkara comes back and saves his friends, and B. Act in contrast to Margaret's belief that Linkara will become evil to see what happens when Linkara's worst impulses get the better of him and decides he's the most important person on the planet. And while he at first just comes off as just another dickish character, it reveals the amount of self-doubt Linkara feels about his own chosen path. This has come up in the past, him questioning why he's a reviewer in the first place and whether or not he's making a difference in the field of sequential art. And this is reflected heavily in Holokara's mentality. Holokara even threatens to hold Marvel Comics editorial hostage to write a story to retcon the infamous Spider-Man story One More Day by J. Michael Straczynski and Joe Quesada from Marvel Canon. Linkara, of course, comes back and defeats him before it's too late, but before that point, he was completely in the dark about what was happening. It's a good character-building moment for Linkara, where he's truly deciding to be a champion, as Vice once called him, instead of just another dick with a spaceship. And as much as Linkara wants to blame himself for not coming back sooner, they later find out it wasn't exactly his fault. Vice managed to tamper with a risk communicator Linksano made for Linkara before he left for Steve's place, frustrating Harvey to the point of considering killing Linkara for leaving in the first place. This, of course, comes from a place of worry, one which I'll explain later. That Halloween, Jairus springs his plan into action, trapping Linkara and his friends inside his apartment as they slowly turn on one another, 90s kid being the first to realize they've been had. After defeating the Phantom and destroying Jairus' anchor to his home dimension, Harvey decides to take a leave for a little bit. While on a concert tour to multiple conventions Linkara's went to, he's confronted with... Okay, another explanation that will be important later... Yare, yare does it. So, the movie To Boldly Flee was made by that guy with the glasses as an effort to kill Doug's character of the Nostalgia Critic in order to pursue more original content for Channel Awesome. In canon, this resulted in the critic fusing with something known as the Plot Hole, basically becoming Dr. Manhattan after an interstellar war near the Jupiter's moon of Europa. This is also where Mechakara once again returns, but I'm choosing not to review all the Channel Awesome films because if outside what they mention in Linkara's storylines, they aren't really relevant. So, the critic does a Christmas carol with Harvey as we finally delve deeper into Harvey's backstory and deeper character. Before he met Linkara, Harvey had a wife and a son named Charlie. Charlie passed away suddenly, throwing Harvey into a deep depression and causing him to get a divorce. He fell hard on the sauce, stopped singing, and eventually passed out near Linkara's house after a particularly rough night. Linkara helped him back on his feet, got him into AA, even gave him work helping with the channel. In a way, Linkara saved him but he soon grew to project the image of his son onto Linkara, developing this unhealthy dependency on the kid because he's afraid of losing people again, never fully moving on. After finally confronting his son's memory, Harvey is worked back to the apartment on Christmas Eve, reconciling with Linkara in the spirit of the season. Also, Holokara made Poyo a new smaller body. I forgot to mention that during the assault on Holokara, so yay, new Poyo. Wow. Linkara and Linkseno finally discover the information on Jairus, and of course Linkara feels bad. 
While at first failing to reach out and find common ground, after Dr. Insano begins his final assault on Linkara for the Ark, Jairus reluctantly joins forces with Linkara after he promises to find a way to return him to his home dimension. So for now, things are once again safe. Linkara and Jairus have started an alliance that will soon become a strong bond of friendship, and Poyo has a new rival in the form of Sierra. Everything seems fine. Until Nimue runs a self-diagnostic, Vice preventing her from telling Linkara the truth. This storyline is dense to be sure, but I kinda love it more than a piece of the world is missing and his blue soul. It delves into lore and explanations for things we took for granted in previous arcs, while also setting up future events in the story to great effect. This is also where we first formally meet recurring guest star Will Wolfgram, who will not only play Vice on camera whenever he's on screen with Linkara, but also the DC cocaine-powered supervillain Snowflame on multiple occasions. He's also a bioelectrical engineer, so yeah, he's just doing this for fun. Good for him. I also feel like now is the time to acknowledge my problems with Margaret's plan. Yes, she didn't know that Holokara would go crazy and that Vice was trying to take over Nimue. That's not her fault. What is their fault is thinking Linkara would go evil after all this time. I think he's been humbled a few times by now due to the events of the prior two arcs. Even though he talked an eldritch god into killing themselves, he got his ass kicked more times than not for the greater good. This is why I feel like Poyo should have died during his blue soul. It could have introduced Margaret and the concept of the magic gun much earlier, while also providing a replacement for Poyo in the form of Nimue. This is all just fanfic conspiracy nonsense, so it doesn't really matter. What does matter is when the hell's Linkar gonna figure out Vice is somehow still alive, and furthermore, since they're inspired by HAL 9000, how scary can Nimue be? I'm going to kill you. During 2099 month, 90s Kid is warped through hypertime over 70 years into the future and replaced in the present with 90s Kid 2099. When he returns, Poyo has now been given multiple new bodies such as a ground form and floating form, but also hands Linkara an encrypted message teasing both the return of Lord Vice as well as another enemy we're well aware of. As the gang attempts to research more ways to help Jairus return to his home dimension, Poyo and a drunken, hopeless Jairus have a heart-to-heart -heart as they discuss what Jairus thought was right, and how all of Linkara's enemies justified their actions the same way. Meanwhile, as Nimue continues to lose more control over herself and her programming, Linkara does some research into the absent grimoire for a magical explanation to Nimue's problems. While still believing the entity to be dead, Linkara discovers the story of its younger cousin, the King of Worms. A long time ago, I remember a fan theory being that the other Elder Gods were data beings slash traumatizing boss characters like Gygus from Earthbound, but the King of Worms sort of disproved that with its own generic evil god lore. The reason why Linkara is suspicious of the King being responsible is mainly due to the fact the King uses clockwork servants to do his bidding, the gang speculating that means AI just as much as it means robots like the Cybermats, which by now are starting to act a little sus. After visiting Linkara and making amends, Jairus notices Nimue visibly freak out and tells Linkara of a similar losing their mind sort of situation he faced with Sierra. Sierra had to be completely reprogrammed with obedience protocols put in place, but Linkara still believes that Nimue isn't in her right mind, that something else is going on. This eventually leads Linkara to running a test on Comicron of One alone, Nimue locking him inside the ship as she drives towards the edge of the known universe. Nimue continues to glitch out and try to scare Linkara by asking if he's afraid and saying that she's going to kill him. Poyo manages to get out a distress call to Jairus, who bucks up and warps onto Comicron 1. As Vice finally reveals himself and his plans to take the ship and chase the entity to wherever it may have gone, Jairus distracts Vice long enough for Linkara and him to escape into the one place Linkara hid from both Nimue and Vice, the Auxiliary Command. Which is just the bridge from Star Trek. Get it? It's the bridge from Star Trek. Don't you like Star Trek, guys? <sighs> I know what that is! Anyways, Vice still manages to find them, but Linkara has done the unthinkable and installed a backup version of Nimue into the ship. Unlike Poyo, Nimue was willing to have herself backed up. All Linkara had to do was just restart the console. So in a flash animation where Nimue almost kills Vice for good, Vice manages to transfer what's left of his data form into a shade aboard Comicron 1. The shade escapes, but Nimue has once again regained control of the ship. Linkara and Jairus return to the apartment and solidify their newfound friendship as Linkara, after five years of using the same outfit, decides it's time for a change. And so, we go from Linkara Classic to Neo Linkara, or Linkara Light Form, with a weird long trench coat. Also, hello, Team Four Stars, Lanny Pator. Ah! This is Alan. He's a government liaison that Linkara met around the time he first took control of Comicron 1. While he won't be relevant right now, he'll be important in the next arc and especially in the movie. 
Right now, he just exists. After all is said and done, Harvey returns home from a concert tour in his new outfit with no one to greet him, and he's a bit peeved until a Cybermat knocks him out, the whispers of the King of Worms' clockwork servants foretelling his arrival. I'm not gonna lie, Nimue in this arc is one of my favorite parts of Linkara's storylines. Nimue was set up as a new AI before becoming a trusted ally due to her programming evolving, and even as she was possessed by Vice and became genuinely intimidating, she returned and proved herself as THE AI for Comicron 1. It sold me on her character for the rest of the storylines. Even if she's just Aelia and HAL 9000 smushed together in a poorly rendered package, the ambition and attempts at building Nimue's character proved to me that regardless of what people may think of Linkara, I at least acknowledge he can sometimes tell a good story. Not all the time, but sometimes. Now, who wants to kill a god? What else can you say but that? Part 8. The Machinations of Worms. I really hate to say this, but as much as I like moments from this storyline, overall it's not my favorite. More than anything, it's a bit of a retread of a piece of the world is missing, with the added inclusion that, spoilers, the entity is still alive. He isn't the main antagonist for this arc, but Missing No has remained dormant for some time, and this arc is when he'll finally be unleashed. Before getting into the meat of the story, we have to talk about the 300th episode and the second appearance of Mirakara, who, after being chased out of his universe by his Insano and Poyo, wants to take Comicron 1 for himself to regain all the power he can. He's even brought along his own version of the Magic Gun, who is not Margaret, but still evil. This leads to Linkara using his new Mega Force Morpher to turn into various different Linkara variants as he talks about what he's accomplished and reaffirms his own life choices and blah blah blah. Mirakara is defeated, he escapes of course, he won't be back for a long, long time. Now for the Lovecraftian invasion of the Body Snatchers. The only people seemingly immune to the Cybermat attacks or the King's control are Poyo, Nimue, Linkara, and the newest cast member of Atop the Fourth Wall, Eliza the Foam Lizard. Alright, I just, I gotta leave, okay? No, we just started, come on, man. We listen, just, listen, gotta... there's a lot to see in this life. I'm not wasting it here. She was brought to life as a Christmas gift for Linkara by Linksano, who upon being rejected as a gift, begins to question their very existence. They slowly but surely start coming to terms with who they are and what they stand for, and for now, that's by the group's side as she starts to explore her own personal interests. And that's about it for Eliza. She's not that important otherwise other than just being another ally for Linkara to have, which sure, fine, funny haha -ha character questions their existence. It just proves this is Rick and Morty before Rick and Morty came out, and I just, I, I, I don't know how to feel about that. Rip, I'm Pickle Rip! I digress. Eventually, Linkara is cornered and taken by the king into his court where, after enough time to bang out two reviews happens, has his mind peered into by the king himself, trying to figure out why he couldn't control him. And what the king sees gives him something he's been searching for this whole time. Fear. His desire was to simply take over and destroy worlds using the power of fear until he could feel it again. And the reason he came to this dimension is because he could no longer worry about the entity interfering with his plans. However, deep inside Linkara is a remnant of the entity. Not as big as what it used to be upon killing itself, it lay dormant within Linkara preventing any eldritch power from consuming him. Until now, where the King of Worms has the alien equivalent of a heart attack out of fear of the entity and its new host. Linkara is freed by Poyo and the gang, returned home just in time for Christmas. And that Christmas, while potentially depressing for Jairus due to not being in his home dimension, is interrupted by a surprise guest. Johanna, Jairus' wife, has managed to develop the tech necessary to jump between dimensions in order to find Jairus. They won their war against the system, mainly because it was stupid in the first place, effectively proving Jairus' whole quest pointless. Either way, he's still able to return to his home universe with the help of a gift Linkara made, a new anchor. Jairus is thankful for all that Linkara has done for him, returning to his home universe for a Merry Christmas after all. Meanwhile, Lord Vice is angered by Linkara's lack of awareness and near failure in confronting the King of Worms. It's then revealed that 90s Kid has been working alongside him, saying it's only a matter of time before they'll need to trust Vice, whether they want to or not. 
Like I said, it's not a bad arc by any means, but it's certainly my least favorite in the grand scheme of things, despite liking it originally. Positives are the resolution to Jairus' character arc, and 90s Kid once again becoming a double agent, but other than that, it's mainly set up for the next big arc. And while I love that big arc and everything it does to cap off years worth of lore, setup is still setup. And while some payoffs are satisfying, others are atop the fourth wall of the movie. Freaking all day, you're seeing things, mate. One minute you come in, you're talking as no one is there. You say, oh, you're, 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 you're. Part nine. I'm gonna make a JoJo Lance joke. Fuck you. <laughs> So I know there's already a very negative review of this film online by Ralph the Movie Maker, and while I can agree with some of his critiques, I'm not going to be nearly as harsh about the movie. Still, it's pretty bad, and I don't think it's written effectively as a film. There's also the behind-the-scenes drama surrounding Channel Awesome denying them the ability to use their studio for filming, which would have cut costs significantly. And that's a shame. However, they had 60k to work with. Technically around 34k since they already paid for everything. It was just mainly reimbursement and providing extras to backers. But still, they had a budget they could use, time to craft storyboards, and develop a cohesive narrative that could possibly stand alone, despite being so late in the timeline. So, what went wrong? The movie, taking place roughly during the early parts of the next storyline, surrounds Linkara's birthday and is developing feelings of doubt about his career again as Alan supervises a space mission to Jupiter on the ship Kyle Estes. Hey, Doug. <laughs> While watching bad movies with all of his close friends at the time, Alan enlists Linkara to help save the now missing crew of the Jupiter mission. Linkara's friends willingly going despite Linkara's attempts to dissuade them. As the game gets closer to the ship's last known location, it's revealed that, shock of all shocks, Mechakara is back. Who could have possibly predicted that? Not me. Now in control of the Kaelestis and personally modifying the crew members to be his cyborg slaves, he attacks Comicron 1 and triggers Linkara's latent PTSD. In the midst of the attack, Alan is mortally wounded, further breaking Linkara despite his friends' attempts to help. After yet another heart-to-heart -heart about Linkara being a good guy and that he should do his show for himself, and you get the idea already, they arrive at the moon base of Europa and Linkara, 90s Kid, and Lupa go to hunt them down. Turns out, due to the events of Tiboli Flea, Europa has developed a biofield that reverses any and all injuries, though it will get weaker the more it tries to heal organic matter. After a brief first encounter with Mechakara, Lupa and 90s Kid return to the ship to get back up as Linkara and Alan's body remain on Europa. Linkara resolves himself yet again, Alan returns to life, and everybody on the ship comes down for one final fight with Mechakara. Mechakara explodes, Alan and the crew of the Kaelestis are healed, and Linkara goes back home to hang with his friends, ending with him reviewing a comic before they continue their bad movie night. Let's talk about the good before the bad. The good is Brad Jones. Well, it's about this couple that steals a dead body and spends all their free time having sex with it. Sorry, the good is the relationship between 90s Kid and Lupa, further delving into 90s Kid's purpose and personality in a compelling way. We also learn that his name is Evelyn, which is lovely. We see the ramifications of the past several storylines and how they've affected Linkara's psyche, which doesn't necessarily go away. After all, the sphere of a lack of purpose permeates a lot of the series, and it only gets worse after this film. So, what are the bad parts? Remember when I said that Linkara was a student of film and not a film student? It shows a lot more in this film, given the budget and tools he debatably should have access to. Static shots, bad fight choreography, repetitious scenes, and our main character barely any different from when they started. And while physical Comicron 1 sets and in-depth CGI spaceship battles are bonuses to this being a film, I don't feel like this is a film regardless. I mean, you can vaguely attach the hero's journey to this film and maybe it can work, but overall I do agree with the critique that some scenes should have been cut for time or the story streamlined for potential new viewers. This is ultimately an extension of the already existing canon of Channel Awesome and Linkara's show, and while yes this is a film for fans, it's not shot any different from your average atop the fourth wall storyline. Just try something more ambitious than a Dutch angle or poorly rendered composites of Linkara characters posing next to one another. This isn't the worst movie I've ever seen, and I don't think this should discourage Lewis from ever trying again, but I think the bad parts of this movie stick out like a sore thumb, and no amount of fan service or in-jokes can really change that. Bees. My god. Ah, ah, he said it! He said it! Now, with the movie out of the way, we can talk about the true follow-up to the machination of worms. Because the entity is coming, and whether we like it or not, it's here to stay. Part 10. The Sleepwalker. Personally, this is my favorite Linkara storyline for the very same reason I also think it's probably one of my least favorites. 
It's long. Hey, yo, what the fuck? It provides not only the necessary setup we come to expect from a Linkara storyline with heaps of exposition and assorted reviewers coming in and out of the series, however, the payoffs are cathartic for longtime viewers, ending the story arcs of the Entity and Lord Vice, all the while managing to set up future plot threads and ending in a way that feels complete. I wouldn't stop right here since, well, the story isn't over technically. We'll get to that when we get to it. But more importantly, new Poyo voice! Yep, he has a voice now! And it's not Linkara! Cheers, lads! Hello. Yes, yes, I like this. British, superior, snarky. And a new character actor, thank God. We were running out of those. This is Julie Sider, a comic artist who parted ways with Lewis during 2020 in order to further her career as a creative. For now, though, she plays the artifact thief and internet reviewer Aaron Yes, Aaron for short. Along with her own floating robot companion, Saris, Aaron tries to break into Linkara's apartment while he's doing his Halloween reviews, this time for A Nightmare on Elm Street, but is surprised to see that Linkara's fallen under the influence of the Magic Coin's thrall. Linkara believes he's being trapped in his room by Freddy Krueger, sleepwalking as he reviews all the comics he's planned for the month until the gang gives Aaron the benefit of the doubt. Aaron temporarily takes the magic coin, which she claims was forged out of an ancient metal capable of killing Elder Gods, and drains it of its magic power. Linkara finally wakes up, defeating Freddy for the moment. On the seventh anniversary of Atop the Fourth Wall, though, Freddy returns with his face shrouded in shadow. He claims not to be Freddy at all, and that it's Linkara's turn in their game. And then... nothing. A lull in any conflict for the next several reviews, and that frightens Linkara to no end. He's come to a realization that in most confrontations with his enemies, he's always been reactive instead of proactive. He wants to discover whoever's been haunting him, make a clear course of action, and end this game once and for all. He's going to try and build a new ship, if possible, and start the fleet he's always wanted to have. And you know what? Linkara's actually grown a bit here. He's right about being fairly reactive to any potential threats, including his earliest enemies. And the fact that the movie takes place between the point of Poyo getting his new voice and this revelation of proactivity shows that Linkara's character has been developing just as much as his many side characters. The real problem lies with the enemy he's facing being something he's all too familiar with. Linkara summons Eren during a review to his apartment to hire her as his new magic historian, entrusting her with the coded letter 90s kid brought back with him from 2099. Time for another interlude of basically no value! Yay! This time, Linkara is brought into Silent Hill outside of October, faced with the now revived Watley and his new Beatles cover band as he tries to play discouraging parody songs. Linkara sings in retaliation with his own Beatles parody song, and it's just as painful as you think it is. Watley is killed once more by Poyo, who they held hostage for some reason, and everybody just goes home. During all of this, mind you, 90s Kid has been colluding with Lord Vice as the Entity has been torturing Linkara from the inside out. We finally get a possible decryption of the message from 2099, and Linkara's immediate response is to warp onto Comicron 1, all hands on deck. The message? A piece of the world is missing. Linkara brings all immediate side characters onto Comicron 1 as they scan the planet for the Entity. 90s Kid, however, stays behind, Comicron 1 unable to find him on their sensors. It's ascertained that the Entity is not on Earth, convincing most of the gang that Linkara has simply been paranoid until the ship itself starts to go haywire. It hurtles towards the moon, forcing Linkara and the gang to abandon ship. Finally using the Vigilant as an escape pod, the gang watches Comicron 1 crashes onto the moon's surface, frying most of its systems and shattering its hull. This hurts Linkara bad, as he believes that Comicron 1 is the only thing that could possibly harm the Entity. And after a violent confrontation with 90s Kid about his whereabouts the past year, Linksano tells Linkara that it was simply a malfunctioning Cybermat responsible for the ship's crash, not the Entity. Linkara, seemingly calm after all the pain he's just went through, moves a pawn on a chessboard that's seemingly still in play. Hey, guess what? My mom! Get out! It was worth it! New place! That's right, in canon, Linkara has been told they're so fucking loud that they've raised their rent to $10,000 a month. This rental home will now be the main set for all future story arcs. So welcome! It's also haunted by the ghosts of worshippers of one of Linkara's friends, who was possessed a long time ago and caused massive damage to various national landmarks. This is also where we first meet Vega, an artist and anime reviewer that ends up marrying Lewis in real life. She's not the greatest actor, but she does have occasional moments of gold, ironic and unironic. I heard you didn't like geeky stuff. Well, 
I like anime. Yeah. As Linkara and Viga go Ghostbusters on the two ghosts, Linkara captures them in a Pokeball before a large portal rips open in their living room. He enters, seeing a skull-faced elder god from the absent grimoire, before returning home with Jairus in tow. Turns out, the ghosts were somehow awakened by Jairus' attempt at transporting to Linkara's universe using new tech. While originally just a visit, this has confirmed to Linkara that their new enemy is something cosmic in nature. And since he's had a suspicion that the entity is somehow involved, he's convinced himself that it's Lord Vice in his data form, attempting to not only become the new entity, but also conquering their known universe. Linkara confronts 90s Kid before Vice warps into whoop the gang's collective asses, taking 90s Kid away. Linkara becomes even more suspicious, blaming his friends for the constant security breaches he's had throughout the years and choosing to track everyone's movements without their knowledge. This comes to a head as 90s Kid tries to reach out to Harvey while he's on tour. Linkara has clearly crossed a line for Harvey and potentially the rest of the gang. 90s Kid trying to convince the gang to join his side since he's already under the impression they know Linkara's possessed. Aaron asks Linkara after another meltdown why he's so afraid of the entity or Vice if he's defeated both before. For him, it's a matter of instilling faith in his own existence. This once again ties back into the movie and the continuous questioning of Linkara's show even mattering in the end. It's simply going beyond the show's existence and questioning whether Linkara's life has meaning at all. And beyond the obvious of his friends and family, Linkara is slowly losing hope in discovering meaning. If he defeats the Entity, an eldritch god that's eons older than most creatures, maybe he won't feel so small. The gang once again confront Linkara after he's hacked into government satellites Alan refused to give him access to, saying they're holding Linkara to a previous promise of stopping him if he ever gets close to turning evil. Linkara disregards their worries and simply focuses on the loss of Comicron 1 and Comicron 2 being incomplete. The gang, sans Nimue and Eren, since Nimue can't really leave the Vigilant, considers their next moves. Linkara finally finishes construction of Comicron 2 and its holodeck technology, using previous parts salvaged from Comicron 1. As he attempts to activate use of the satellites, the gang had begun a ground-based assault on Linkara's apartment. Linkara sends Cybermats to dispose of them, but Lord Vice warps them all into a pocket dimension to finally explain what's going on. And Linkara, at the same time, reveals the truth to Eren. He's now the new entity, and it's up to Vice and Linkara's friends to save Linkara from the entity's influence. In order to awaken Linkara, Vice believes a symbol is in order, something to remind Linkara of his cause and what he's doing. Returning to the wreckage of Comicron 1, Vice activates the latent systems locked behind his access, including the Forge. The Forge reconstitutes all missing parts from Comicron 1, allowing it to take flight as Linkara's inner spirit recognizes the ship's hull from within his possessed body. It gives Linkara the hope he needs to fight back somehow, Eren using the magic coin to somehow split Linkara and the Entity once more, the Entity taking residence now in the holodeck of Comicron 2. Escaping onto Comicron 1 with Eren and Saris, Linkara and Vice forge an alliance to take down the Entity once and for all. And before they do their master plan of steering Comicron 2 into a multi-pronged portal created by the government satellites, Linkara manages to get in one last review. Which, by now, even Lord Vice has somehow acknowledged is so fucking weird that Linkara manages to review anything in the face of mortal danger. Though, Linkara brings up a pretty good point before the mission begins. If the Entity is truly back, why hasn't it tried consuming all of reality again? Why is it only bothering them? Linkara warps onto Comicron 2 to help steer the ship into the portal, and after barely surviving his encounter with the Entity, finally realizes the way to beat them. Not playing the game. In truth, the Entity is scared of the exact same lack of purpose Linkara feels, and that fear is crippling. Instead of continuing a white-knuckle boss fight, Linkara once again talks the remnants of this data god off their ledge by telling them the facts of life. They may not have a purpose. They can choose to believe in something greater to give them comfort, but if there isn't a purpose to begin with, might as well enjoy your life while you still can. This satisfies the Entity, seemingly vanishing from existence once and for all. This does not satisfy Vice, though, who betrays the group using Comicron 1 to force Comicron 2 into the portal. Linkara fakes possession using the Holocara tech in conjunction with the Holodeck, trapping Lord Vice on the ship as Linkara warps back into Comicron 1 at the last second. Since the portal would close only if a data entity passed through it, it accepted Vice in the place of the entity, sealing Vice in a place outside of space-time for eternity. Linkara and 90s Kid have a heart-to-heart. -heart. Linkara sincerely apologizes for his behavior and fall from grace in the face of possession. He was aware of what he was doing while possessed since it was all of his latent rage stirred by the entity. 90s Kid forgives him since he's no saint either, saying Linkara is a good person deep down and his actions in the storyline have proven that. 
He also formally changes his name since he's around 30 or so from 90s kid to 90s dude. The two go off to celebrate with the rest of the gang as a note flashes into existence on Linkara's desk chair, an invitation to the contest of champions. Like I said, this was my favorite storyline to watch and cover in this video, and I think it's apparent why. Its twists are built on continuously, set up well enough that, even if you manage to realize what's happening, the character drama justifies the extended length. I think this was a great arc for Linkara's character, finally turning him into a proper hero as the two biggest enemies he's ever faced have finally been defeated. And that came at the cost of a potential reconciliation with Lord Vice, who showed shades of humanity in this arc we've never seen before. Everyone feels a little more fleshed out, and even new additions like Eren don't feel so forced. In fact, Eren works really well in conjunction with Jairus and the recruitment of Linksano way back in Storyline 4. All in all, if you're this deep into the video, I hope you felt as much narrative catharsis from this arc as I have, because this storyline and Storyline 11 are probably Linkara at his best. Tournament arc. That's it, that's the storyline. Okay. Basically, a bunch of extra-dimensional Time Lords set up a multi-dimensional game show where appointed champions from across all realities compete for a special prize. Jairus had participated in a previous one, but failed to make it into the top three, making him unable to participate again. Linkara joins the game after learning of the prize as an infinity gauntlet from a parallel universe where there are only five gems, yet still as powerful as the other one. He doesn't want something of that magnitude going into the wrong hands, and after fighting in a preliminary round against friendly dark magician Empira, Linkara has formally joined the Contest of Champions. Here are the rules. You get detailed documents on every single champion you could possibly face, wait for your match, you agree upon match turns with your chosen opponent so there's a level of fairness in the competition, and fight to make it up the ladder. The competition can be literally anything from sharpshooting to rock, paper, scissors, but they mainly boil down to fighting. Just non-lethal fighting. One of the champions is a pile of rocks. Okay. The only other match Linkara has is against a jobber named Levitin Skarn, a truly cruel son of a gun whose throne was usurped by his brother and, upon defeat, rages so hard that the game masters boot him from any future contests. There's also another contestant in the form of Bandit Chief, voiced by Martin Bilney of Yu-Gi-Oh! Bridged. Yummy, you little b you son of a ink. I'm gonna tear off your- But they're set up as an overarching antagonist for the tournament that, at the time of recording, hasn't been finished. That's right, it's only part one of a presumably two-part storyline, one that, while very fun to see, just feels incomplete. What we do learn of general importance beyond the tournament is that, without Lord Vice, most of Comicron 1's databanks have been wiped out, and most of the functions have been returned to normal sans the Forge. That's about all I can say. What fun there is to be had is with the occasional references to other creators and Rick and Morty tier humor that I feel most sci-fi comedies have done in the past, including here. Again, not a bad arc, but due to how it's incomplete, I can't really analyze it further. Instead, we go to the final current storyline of Atop the Fourth Wall, one that I'm sure you've all been waiting for. Did somebody say clones? No! Part 12, The Clone Saga. In 2018, Atop the Fourth Wall celebrated its 10th anniversary, and in the celebration of 10 years of making comic book reviews, the final storyline is a reference in of itself to the conceit of the first filmed episode. During a lull between tournament matches, an identical genetic copy of Linkara stumbles into his apartment. After doing enough tests to ensure that this second Linkara is indeed not a clone, Linkara opens his home to him as Aaron sympathizes with their plights. Linkara tries to do some research before Harvey reminds him that all the way back in storyline number one, he cloned Spoonie. In truth, Linkara's mind had been wiped clean of that point in history. All the moral ambiguity of cloning his friend and programming their mind to their liking was all but forgotten due to the person actually responsible for the Spoonie clone, Dr. Linksano. In a shocking retcon, Linksano actually met Linkara before the events of Storyline 2, convincing him he was just another dimensional refugee willing to help him to further his evil deeds. While he at first toyed with a clone army, he soon gave up on the notion after becoming Linkara's ally. This breach of trust clearly fucks with Linkara, especially given the finished clone of Linkara has escaped its pod. Meanwhile, Clone Kara, as I'll call him, grows more and more irritated with his circumstances, not even liking the idea of living a life with Lewis's face. He kind of hates his face. In an effort to get more answers, Clone Kara summons the spirit of Watley from the absent grimoire, Watley immediately recognizing who he is and choosing to toy with him instead of actually helping. Soon after this, Clone Kara finally realizes the truth. 
He's actually been Mechakara all along. Oh shit. Brought back to life by the remnants of the biofield on Europa after the events of the movie. And while Linkara fights off Mechakara to save Eren from her then captor, Eren knocks Linkara out. When Linkara awakens, another shocking reveal becomes apparent. Eren's a double agent. In truth, this was all a plan by Mirror Kara, who raised Eren on the world he was trapped on after the events of the 300th episode. He soon found his way back to this universe for revenge during the events of the movie, picking up an amnesiac Mechakara and putting him in deep freeze. Originally sending Eren to kidnap the magic coin before realizing Linkara was possessed by the entity, he waited for the events of the Sleepwalker to play out before making his move. He also kidnapped the clone Link Sano maid to fuck with Linkara further, given his Insano had a laboratory in a similar location. Our Insano, however, simply told Linkara when he asked about clones that clones were kind of a hack job anyway. This has all been a plan to take over atop the fourth wall and besmirch Lewis's name the world over, which is just the perfect amount of petty given they have the same taste in comics. Eren turns on Mirakara due to her treatment by him and eventually his mistreatment of Ceres, who he helped build in the first place. Linkara and Eren defeat Mirakara, who, upon trying to escape to the storage room, is seemingly killed by the final character I have yet to introduce, the exclusive to October horror comics host Moarte and his long box of the damned. And so, once again, the gang are safe and Eren has solidified herself as a true ally to Linkara's cause. No harm, no foul. And since it's been another five years, Linkara decides it's time for yet another costume change. And so, I introduce to you, fair viewers, Linkara Neo Blue! Here's to the next 10 years. Also, Mechakara scheming in the background. Oh no! As a 10th anniversary to atop the fourth wall, the Clone Saga is everything you could want and more. Needless retcons, deep cuts into Linkara lore, the return of the fabled Mechakara in overly dramatic fashion, and a decent mystery before the big reveal. This is where Lewis actually gets better at filming his own storylines, and it's sad that it's near the end of this retrospective. I real enjoyed how this storyline looked more than the previous ones. Maybe it's because I've seen how far Lewis has come in over a decade, but I think his ambition has finally started to catch up with his craft. It's not perfect by any means, but it entertained me thoroughly. And after sitting through around 16 to 17 hours of Atop the Fourth Wall cataloging the entire story, that's all I can ask for. At the time of recording, Atop the Fourth Wall has not stopped production. Sure, scheduling isn't Lewis's favorite thing to talk about, but he's consistently pumped out content for as long as I'd been in grade school and still does now. You may be asking at the end of all of this why I enjoyed Linkara's work so much. Why did I throw myself into this gauntlet of internet reviewer plot lines and needless internet drama just to make an overly long analysis of something only a small niche of people would really give a shit about? It's because of two things. One, because I was bored. And no one else made this video, so I wanted to. The very thought of doing such a thing is just sickening. And two, well, it's something I was invested in. Something I gave a shit about at some point in my life. I think the thing Lewis taught me the most about content creation on the internet, especially entertainment analysis, is that people will watch something simply because the person talking about it is passionate enough. And Lewis, despite his bad acting and cringe dialogue and occasional hot takes that I still don't agree with, Overdrive isn't that bad once a ranger is actually a pretty good team up, I'm sorry, held my attention all these years because of that passion. Because of that love for the medium of comics, and the idea that maybe, just maybe, his own original stories could be just as loved as the material he read for a living. You can call that wishful thinking or a fruitless effort all you want. Me though? I await every Monday, or every other Monday sometimes, for the next Atop the Fourth Wall to listen to as I eat a bowl of curry and rice, awaiting the continuation of a story I've tuned into since I was nine years old. And Lewis, if you're watching this, thank you for everything. And to you, my fair, fair viewer, thank you for watching.